Now, there are a couple of ways, I suppose, that we can compare these two concepts of creation and evolution. One is in terms of their ability to fit the scientific data. Which one is more scientific than the other? Which one is more factual? And we often, in our work at the Institute for Creation Research, have shown we believe that creation fits the scientific data far better than evolution. And therefore, it's a better model within which to understand the world, the history of the world. But another way we can compare the two is through their impact on the world, that is, compare the two in terms of what they produce and what they've accomplished in the lives of people down through the ages as well as right now. Now, uh, we've had quite a bit to say in other times and places about the scientific validity of these two concepts. And what I want to stress just as we introduce this talk, we're not going to be talking about science so much here, except to point out that the evolutionary concept not only has no scientific data really to support it, but also has accomplished nothing useful in science at all. Now, many scientists believe in evolution, and many have tried to determine how evolution works, and they've tried to understand it, and they've utterly failed. They, nobody knows how evolution works. Nobody's ever been able to show any example of evolution taking place from one type to a higher type. So there's no scientific evidence for evolution, but neither has there any scientific benefit resulting from the study of evolution. Dr. Judson, Horace Judson, in an article a few years ago, uh, reviewing the what he called the century of the sciences, showing the tremendous impact and, and really good that science has accomplished in the world, then finally came to this conclusion towards the end of his article. He said, still, even today, certain major sciences offer scant prospect of practical application. Astronomy and cosmology are of little earthly use. Evolutionary theory has not bred a single new species of animal or vegetable let alone improve the intensity of our pleasures or the intelligence or docility of our children. Evolution has accomplished nothing good in science. And then another statement from a man by the name of Dr. George Marsden, who is a professor of history of science. He said, evolution may have scientific experts on its side, but it does strain popular common sense. It is simply difficult to believe that the amazing order of life on Earth arose spontaneously out of the original disorder of the universe. Not only does evolution accomplish nothing good in science, but it's, it's contrary to common sense to believe that more and more complex organisms could happen just by chance through the evolutionary process. It's contrary to common sense. And he also says this, creation scientists are correct in perceiving that in modern culture, evolution often involves far more than biology. The basic ideologies of our civilization, including its entire moral structure, are at issue. Evolution is sometimes the key mythology or a mythological element in a philosophy that functions as a virtual religion. Evolution, basically, he says, is a religion, although he's an evolutionist, and it does have impact in many areas other than biology. Not only all the sciences, but in all the social sciences and the humanities. Just about every discipline in our modern society is affected and permeated with evolutionary thinking. Now, we could go down the list of all the different disciplines that one could study in, in school, in the university, whether it's biology or physics or chemistry or astronomy or paleontology or anthropology, and then we can get over into such fields as history and sociology and psychology, and even in the fine arts, music and art and history and literature and philosophy and so on. And you'd find that as they're taught today everywhere, they're based on the premise of evolution. So evolution does permeate our whole society. And furthermore, that impact has been uh, devastatingly harmful. Evolutionists like to say that evolution is science and creation is religion. And they sort of ridicule creationists saying that, well, we just believe in, in creation because the Bible teaches it or because we're religious or we're not very good thinkers. We can't really see the scientific evidence. Well, nothing can be further th from the truth than that because evolution is a religion and requires far greater faith to believe than does creation. Let me uh, just in passing, note that the great religions of the world, far more of them are based on evolution than is true of creation. All the great ethnic religions, all the great uh, religions of the East, for example, Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism and animism, as well as all the ancient religions of Greece and Egypt and Rome and all the others, all of them are based on evolution. And by that I mean not modern Darwinism, but the idea that all things have arisen by processes basically innate to the universe. The universe of space and time and matter and energy, there was no beginning 
in the, any of these religious systems, they believe the universe is eternal and that its own systems have developed uh, complex uh, systems in the inorganic world and then finally animals and human beings have arisen out of the uh, forces of nature. Now, this is true in practically all of the religions of the world, ancient or modern, with the exception of those few religions, basically just three today, that believe in one creator God. And those three really are Judaism, the religion of the Jews, and Islam, the religion of the Muslims, and Christianity. And the reason these all believe in one God and in creation is because they all believe in the book of Genesis, which is the only religious book of antiquity which begins with God rather than with the cosmos or with the universe already in existence. So really the, uh, the source of our information about creation comes ultimately from the Bible. Now, all the other religions are basically evolutionary religions. And so it's certainly incorrect to say that evolution is based on science and creation on religion because far, many, far more religions are based on evolution than on creation. Well, keep that in mind because now we're going to look at some of the effects and the impacts of the evolutionary worldview or the evolutionary religion upon modern life in this great warfare that's going on between God and evil. Now, Many people think that evolution began with uh, Charles Darwin, but of course uh, that goes back much further than Darwin. And I like to compare these two worldviews or two religions in terms of two great trees, the creation tree and the evolution tree. You know, Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. We can not only compare the two religions in terms of their ability to fit the facts of science, but in terms of the fruits that they produced. Jesus said, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth a good fruit. And so let's look at the fruits that have been produced by these two religious systems and compare them in terms of their effects that way. Well, the creation tree, we're not going to spend time on that because I do uh, cover that subject, the fruits of creationism, in another uh, video lecture called uh, The God Who is Real. But today we want uh, to just to note in passing that all the basic doctrines of the Christian faith, as well as our American system, true education, true history, true science, all basically come from belief in creation. We discuss that more in the other lectures I mentioned. But the evolution tree has produced bad fruits. It's produced evil practices. It's produced false philosophies. Now we can go back to Darwin. Now, he didn't begin evolution, but he's the one who gets a lot of credit for it today. And right at the very end of his book on the origin of species by natural selection, he said this. This is the last paragraph of his book. He says, thus from the war of nature, he's talking about a warfare too, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. If you follow what he's saying there, he says, through the struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, the strong killing off the weak, then those that are fit will survive and finally will produce higher and higher organisms and eventually they will produce the higher animals, finally man. In other words, he says that by death came man. The Bible, of course, puts it exactly opposite. By man came death. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12. And many other scriptures, too. But you can uh, sort of deduce, even without looking at the evidence, that any philosophy which is based on the idea of struggle and suffering and the strong killing off the weak in order to survive, if that's the basic philosophy that's going to rule the affairs of the world, then that's going to produce some bad systems and bad practices in the world. Basically, it's a world of selfishness. Get what you can while you can, and the devil take the hindmost. That's the basic idea of the evolutionary system. Now. Let's look at some of the fruits that this system has produced. In the first place, evolution is the explanation for things without God. If a person wants to be an atheist, he must be an evolutionist. And many people do want to be atheists because they don't want to have to submit to God. And they would like to find some excuse to get away from God. They may call it humanism. And of course, if we're going to do away with God, then uh, in effect, man as being the highest uh, attainment of the evolutionary process, man himself becomes in effect God. And so that becomes humanism. There is an association called the American Humanist Association in which many of the leading intellectuals of our day uh, write and teach 
to which they belong. It was formed in 1933, primarily by John Dewey, who is the architect of our modern public education system. And he has imposed a system of humanism upon the whole educational process today. Not only in this country, but actually it's affected practically every country in the world. And also by Julian Huxley, a great atheist scientist who was the first director general of UNESCO. It has had a tremendous impact on the world. And then there were others of like mind that joined with him in forming the American Humanist Association. They've listed the things in which humanists believe. And uh, I think it's important to note that the first one is, is evolution. The first tenet of humanism is that religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. The universe is eternal. It uh, never was created. Therefore, it has organized itself. And the second tenet is that humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process. And so on. We won't go through the others, but those are the two basic tenets. First, that the universe evolved and man evolved, and everything else then is in that process of evolution. Now, if anyone wants to defend humanism as being maybe something that's uh, nice and humanitarian, uh, I want to emphasize that this is nothing but atheism under another term. The uh, Days of Charles Darwin were, of course, marked by times when everybody in a very short time moved over to believe in evolution, even in the Christian West. And unfortunately, many theologians were in the vanguard of causing the churches to follow evolution. But there was one great theologian of the time, a man by the name of Dr. Charles Hodge at Princeton, who didn't follow that lead. He wrote a book entitled, What is Darwinism? And he analyzed the teachings of Darwinism thoroughly, and he came to the conclusion that although not all evolutionists are atheists. Evolution itself is atheism. Darwinism is atheism. And of course we see that today very firmly established and taught in all of our public institutions, not only the schools and universities, but the news media and the government and so on. I think it's interesting to note the statement of Dr. Isaac Asimov, who is probably the world's most prolific science writer. He's written over 500 science books. He's written on just about every field of science there is. He's even written a couple of Bible commentaries, although I don't know why he would do that, because he doesn't believe the Bible. Anyway, he says this, and the reason I'm reading this is because he is the current president of the American Humanist Association. He says, I am an atheist out and out. It took me a long time to say it. I've been an atheist for years and years, but somehow I felt it was intellectually unrespectable to say one was an atheist because it assumed knowledge one didn't have. Better to say one was a humanist or an agnostic. But I finally decided I'm a creature of emotion as well as reason. Emotionally, I'm an atheist. I don't have the evidence to prove that God doesn't exist, but I so strongly suspect he doesn't. I don't want to waste my time. That's the statement of Isaac Asimov, the most influential science writer of our day and the president of the American Humanist Association. And note the significant point that he makes there. He says, I don't have the evidence to prove atheism. I believe in atheism because that's what I want to believe. Emotionally, I'm an atheist. Now, if Dr. Asimov doesn't have any evidence to prove evolution, nobody does because he knows science as well as anybody in the world. He's written on every field of science. He's a good scientist. He knows the facts of science. But he insists on interpreting them all in terms of atheism because that's what he wants. And really, anyone who is an atheist is an atheist simply because he wants to be, not because there's any scientific evidence for it. Well, not only has evolutionism served as the basis of humanism, and atheism, getting rid of God, but also has gotten rid of Christianity. Now let me read a statement from the American Atheist magazine. Now I'm sure that uh, not too many people read this because I don't guess a lot of people who go to church subscribe to the American Atheist. I do because I want to see what they say. And this was in the American Atheist magazine. This is published by the American Atheist Association under Madeleine Murray O'Hare there in Texas. Uh, Mr. Bozarth, G. Richard Bozarth, in an article entitled The Meaning of Evolution, says Christianity has fought and still fights and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin. In the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, and Christianity is nothing. And so evolutionism gets rid of Christianity because we have death and suffering long before there was any sin in the world. And so the idea that Jesus Christ could die for our sins 
and therefore pay the penalty for them becomes meaningless because death was in the world long before Jesus ever showed up or even before sin ever came. And so the whole meaning of Christianity is out the window. And the sad thing is that these atheists seem to understand that better than a lot of Christians do. Because many Christians think it doesn't really make any difference whether you believe in evolution or not. It makes a terrible difference because if one is consistent in his thinking and logical in his reasoning, he will see that if he believes in evolution, he cannot believe in Christianity. They simply don't go together. Here's another statement from a man by the name of Dr. E.O. Wilson. And Dr. Wilson is one of the most bitter enemies of Christianity in the country today. He's a professor at Harvard University. He's uh, the architect of the system known as sociobiology, which tries to explain human societies in terms of animal and insect societies. And Dr. Wilson has said that biblical Christianity is one of the unmitigated evils of the world. Well, how did he come to that position? Well, here's his own testimony. He says, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. But when I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolutionary theory. And that testimony of Dr. Wilson can be multiplied many times over. I spent a good part of my life teaching in secular universities, in five of them actually. And I've seen this happen over and over again. Young people from good Christian churches and good Christian homes uh, get to the university and pretty soon they're just overwhelmed by the tremendous uh, influence and uh, pressure to believe in evolution and all the systems that are built upon evolution. I had many, many sad testimonies of that sort that we could share so that Christianity is destroyed really by evolution. Jacques Monod, the great French scientist, biologist, won a Nobel Prize. Just before he died, he was also another atheistic humanist. He said, natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. Then he goes on to say, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. You see, if evolution is really true, that means that uh, God, if there is a God using the evolutionary process as his process of creation, used the most wasteful, inefficient, cruel process that anybody could conceive of by which to produce man. It just makes no sense to believe that a God who is powerful and wise and loving would do such a thing as that. People say, well, can't you be a Christian evolutionist? Uh, yeah, there are Christians who are evolutionists. I myself was one all through college, and so I can understand that and sympathize a little bit with it. But the fact is, it's a contradiction in terms. Evolution is not Christian. Christians can be lots of things they ought not to be. Christian, you can be a Christian liar. You can be a Christian thief. You can be a Christian adulterer. You can be a Christian evolutionist, but you ought not to be any of those things because these are contrary in the very nature of things to the doctrine of Christianity. Well, let's go on beyond that. Not only does evolution permeate all the disciplines as they're taught today, not only has it resulted in the destruction of belief in theism, belief in God, but also in Christianity, to those who think logically at least, but as a matter of fact, it has been the basic uh, philosophy underlying all the evil systems that have plagued the world since the days of Charles Darwin. For example, take Nazism under Adolf Hitler in Germany. Now, I don't know whether everybody realizes or not that Hitler was a thoroughgoing evolutionist and his whole philosophy was based on evolution. And he believed in the idea that, that uh, there was an evolutionary struggle among the different races and nations. And he thought the Teutonic race was better than all the others because it had evolved further. And therefore, it was destined to rule the world. And the only way he could really do that was through this struggle for existence, warfare between nations, so that the best would survive. Let me read a statement from Dr. Daniel Gossman in a book entitled The Scientific Origins of National Socialism, which was Hitler's philosophy. He says, Hitler stressed and singled out the idea of biological evolution as the most forceful weapon against traditional religion. And he repeatedly condemned Christianity for its opposition to the teachings of evolution. For Hitler, evolution was the hallmark of modern science and culture. He defended its veracity as tenaciously as Haeckel, who was Darwin's contemporary in Germany and popularized evolution in Germany, leading finally to World War I and World War II uh, based on Darwinian teachings. Now, Nazism, National Socialism, Hitlerism has pretty well died out. It, it didn't work. It failed. 
because it was based on a false premise, but look at the terrible damage it did before it finally was put down. And the same thing is true with communism. And the same thing is true with communism. Here's an interesting statement. Of course, everybody knows, I guess, by now that Karl Marx was an evolutionist. In fact, he wanted to dedicate his book on capital to Darwin. And all the communists from Marx's day on to the present day have been evolutionists. That's one of their tenets. But here's an article by a man by the name of Cliff Connor in a magazine called International Socialist Review, the monthly magazine to the supplement to the militant. November 1980, this was written, and this was written against the creation movement, evolution versus creation, in defense of scientific thinking was the title. And he says this, by defending Darwinism, working people strengthen their defenses against the attacks of these reactionary outfits, which he means creationists, and they prepare the way for the transformation of the social order. He says, we are revolutionary socialists whose aim is, as Marx said, not merely to interpret the world, but to change it. And of all those eminent researchers of the 19th century that, we have, that have left us such a rich heritage of knowledge, we're especially grateful to Charles Darwin for opening our way to an evolutionary dialectical understanding of nature. Communism was based on evolution, and of course now we see communism failing too around the world, because it also is based on a false premise. Well now we can't take a, a lot of pride in that, because as a matter of fact, even in this country and in the so-called Christian West, what might be called laissez-faire capitalism, that is capitalism operating under the idea that the strongest survive in the world of economics and corporations and businesses and so on, that also is based on evolution. Let me read a statement from Andrew Carnegie, one of the great industrialists of the 19th century, who now, whose name is now somewhat revered. He's got a great university named after him and a great library and foundation and so on. But he said this in one of his articles, he said, the law of competition is here, we cannot evade it. No substitutes for it have been found. And while the law may sometimes be hard for individuals, it's best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. And he justified then his monopolistic practices and his exploitation of labor and all of these things on the basis of evolution. He says, I remember that light came in as a flood and all was clear. Not only had I got rid of theology and the supernatural, but I found the truth of evolution. And what's true of Carnegie was true of John D. Rockefeller, the oil baron, and Raymond Hill, the railroad baron, and many others who, whose uh, modus operandi and whose philosophy was the survival of the fittest and the struggle for existence and Darwinian evolution. They called it in those days social Darwinism. Now that has kind of a bad name among many people today, but as a matter of fact, many of our modern capitalists are still operating on the same principle. And this leads to the uh, subject of racism, because uh, this is tied in with it too. Hitler was a racist, Marx was a racist, men like Rockefeller were racist. Matter of fact, Charles Darwin was a racist. Many people have the idea that racism, the idea that one race is better than another race, that that came from uh, the Southern fundamentalists or something like that, but that isn't true. It's an evolutionary idea. In fact, a race is basically an, a, a, an evolutionary term. It's a subspecies in the process of evolving into a new species. In fact, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection, was subtitled The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And he was talking not just about animal races, but about uh, human races. In fact, let me read a statement, not from The Origin of Species, but from his other book, The Descent of Man. He says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies, man is very close to the ape, he says, but the break between them will then be wider because it will intervene between man and a more civilized state as the lower human races are eliminated, and as we may hope, even then the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. That's a terrible thing for a man to say. He said there was not very much of a gap between the Negro and the Australian and the gorilla. And now since both the higher apes like the gorillas are going to be eliminated and the lower races like these uh, Negroes and Australians and so on are going to be eliminated, then the gap between man and the apes will be wider. In other words, he believed that there was an evolutionary succession and that the higher apes were very closely related to the lowest human races and so on up to the highest race, which was a Caucasian. Now, no evolutionist, I don't think, believes that today, but that's what Darwin believed. 
As a matter of fact, that's what Thomas Huxley believed, and all of the 19th century scientists who were leading evolutionists, almost all of them, believed in racism. And it wasn't just the 19th century. This belief prevailed in this country among evolutionary anthropologists who deal with the history of mankind up until the middle of the century when Hitler finally gave racism a bad name. And then they stopped believing it. But here, for example, is what Henry Fairfield Osborne said. Now, Osborne, if you're not familiar with him, was the probably the leading anthropologist of this country up until the mid-century point. He was the director of the American Museum of Natural History. He was the one who became famous for his discovery and promotion of the so-called Nebraska man, which turned out to be not an ape man at all like he thought, but rather an extinct pig. But he was going to introduce that evidence at the famous Scopes trial. Anyway, Osborne was a top authority among anthropologists, and look what he said. Among other things, this is in his article on the evolution of human races, published in Natural History. He said, in my opinion, the three primary stocks diverged from each other before the beginning of the Pleistocene or Ice Age. In other words, the three great races have been evolving independently of each other for about a million years. He says, the Negroid stock is even more ancient than the Caucasian and Mongolian, as may be proved by an examination not only of the brain and the hair and the bodily characters, the teeth, the genitalia, the sense organs, and the instincts, the intelligence, he says then, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapiens. What a thing to say. For a man at 19, well, this originally was published in 1926. In other words, he says that the Negro race is not even of the species Homo sapiens, but some kind of lower race, not even human. Now, understand, no evolutionist that I know of believes that today. Maybe there are a few, but uh, not many, because uh, they stopped believing in racism when, with Hitler giving it such a bad name. But that's what they did believe during all the great time of the advance of modern evolution in the thinking of anthropologists and other evolutionists. Well, you could go on and show that all the other evil philosophies that have plagued the world are based on evolutionary thinking. But the same is also true of evil practices. So some of those listed on the fruit as the fruit of the evolutionary tree. Practices such as abortionism, for example. Now, many Christians are very concerned about this terrible plague of abortion that has been sweeping over our country the last several years. And of course people commit sin for all kinds of reasons. Not every young woman who has an abortion or doctor who performs one is an evolutionist, but whenever anybody tries to justify it scientifically or rationally, they do so on the basis of the fact that the fetus which is aborted is not really a human being. Well how can they say there's not a human being? Well they do so on the basis of evolution. You see, one of the main proofs of evolution which Charles Darwin advocated back in 1859 in his book, and as a matter of fact, which his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, advocated in his book, uh, even before Charles Darwin was born, is the idea of embryologic recapitulation. Now, I don't know how many people have heard of that. It used to be taught in all the biology textbooks in high schools, and I think in the general science books in junior high schools, and certainly in all the colleges, the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms, let me read the statement of a man by the name of Eli Schnur in an article in the Los Angeles Times just last year. And Dr. Schnur says he is, was chairman of the Southern California Skeptic Society, but he's also director of the Biosystems Research Institute in La Jolla, California. Now, this man is discussing this point. He says, life doesn't begin, it continues. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This is a fundamental tenet of modern biology that derives from evolutionary theory and is thus anathema to the creationists as well as to those who are opposed to freedom of choice. Now he defines what these two terms are, so here's what he's talking about. Ontogeny is the name for the process of development of a fertilized egg into a fully formed and mature living organism. So the development of the embryo in the womb is ontogeny. Phylogeny, on the other hand, is the history of the evolution of a species, in this case the human being the evolutionary history. And he says, during the development, this fertilized egg progresses over 38 weeks through what is, in fact, a rapid passage through evolutionary history. From a single primordial cell, the conceptus progresses through being something of a protozoan, then a fish, then a reptile, then a bird, a primate, ultimately a human being. And so you see this fetus in the womb, they like to call it fetus instead of a little baby, it starts out as a one-celled organism in a liquid environment like that imaginary primeval cell in the primordial soup, and it develops into a, a, a multi-celled invertebrate, 
and then into a vertebrate in a liquid environment still it becomes a fish with gills and gill slits and then it becomes an amphibian then finally a reptile and maybe a monkey with a tail and eventually a human being and so if you destroy that and so if you destroy that fetus before it becomes a human being well, all you've done is kill a fish or a monkey or something and so what that's the rationale the scientific rationale on which uh, abortionists justify their position that this is not really a human being. But you see that whole theory of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny has been completely disproved a long time ago. It's not true at all. This embryo does not go through in any kind of an evolutionary history. It's fully programmed to be a human being from the very time of conception. This is in the DNA molecule. It's genetic programmed. It could never be anything else. It never is anything else during the whole time of development. This has been proved beyond any question. Let me read a statement from Dr. Keith Stewart Thompson ontogeny and phylogeny recapitulated. This was in the American Scientist magazine just two years ago. And Dr. Thompson is the dean of the graduate school at Yale University and professor of biology there, so he knows what he's talking about. And he says, surely this law, this biogenetic law as it was called, is dead as a doornail. It was finally exorcised from biology textbooks in the 1950s. Well, not all of them. You still find it occasionally. As a topic of serious theoretical inquiry, it was extinct in the 20s. And so it's been a long time that people, scientists, real scientists, have known that that isn't true, and yet you still hear it and because they want to justify abortionism. And so that practice really has its basis in evolutionary theory. And you see, it's not going to do much good to continually be fighting abortion and trying to get laws passed and, and preventing it from happening. It's like plucking a bad fruit, bad apple off an apple tree, but if you don't dig out the roots of the tree, it's going to grow right back again. And so we need to get at the roots and not just the fruits. And the roots of the abortion idea is evolution. And the same thing is true of our drug culture. Now, that may not be quite as obvious, but you see, here's what has happened in the drug culture. Of course, people all through the ages, some people have used drugs, particularly in the uh, occult religions and things like that. But that didn't become common in the Christianized West until just fairly recently. And the trigger that set it off was the philosophy of Aldous Huxley, who was the brother of Julian Huxley, who I quoted a little while ago, who was the grandson of Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog in his day. All of these men were atheists. And Aldous Huxley, a great literary figure, he's probably more, better known than even Julian Huxley. Aldous Huxley uh, got across the idea in many of his books that since we have now eliminated God because of evolutionism, God is dead, so to speak, we still need, however, this religious experience which is being born again produced in the life of a person so we can get that religious experience without being religious by using drugs and we can just in a moment of time experience an eternity of bliss and that sort of thing. And in one article he says this, he says, all that one can predict with any degree of certainty is that many of our traditional notions about ethics and religion and many of our current views about the nature of the mind will have to be reconsidered and reevaluated in the context of the pharmacological revolution. He's talking about drugs there, produced by the pharmacologists. It will be extremely disturbing, but it'll also be enormous fun. Well, fun indeed, those who have gone that route, and I know that probably some, even in this church have, as in our church, you know that that isn't fun, it leads to death, if you don't uh, eliminate that out of your life, and you can do that only through, really through the power and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, and so on. We can talk about many other evil practices. How about the modern homosexual revolution, as it's called? Here's a statement from a, a so-called gay magazine, written by a man by the name of Jacob Smith. He says, homosexuality is seldom discussed as a component in evolution, but undoubtedly plays a role. Homosexual behavior has been observed in most animal species studied, and the higher we climb on the taxonomic tree toward mammals, the more apparent homosexual behavior we see. And more and more we're going to hear of that, that this kind of practice, which has been condemned from, throughout, from the beginning of history in the Word of God, and in most civilized societies, is now going to be more and more justified on the basis that it's natural in evolutionary thinking. Well, we don't have the time to go through all, all these other things. Uh, this is discover, discussed in great detail in the first half of my book on the long war against God, and I really think this book is maybe the most significant that I've ever written, so I hope that many of you will want to read that for yourselves, in which many more details are discussed and many more evidences of this fact that evolution is the basis of all harmful philosophy and evil practice in the world today.
Now we're really concerned about the so-called New Age movement. This is nothing new about this, really. It's just a simple, simply a revival of ancient pagan pantheism is what it is. But uh, it is uh, very much influential today, and it's affecting a very wide spectrum of people, all the way from people, um, say, witch, witches and astrologers and things like that on the one hand, and scientists on the other hand. Many different scientific the fields are being discussed in terms of New Age thinking. Uh, those who uh, are really involved in the movement, they had a survey a few years ago as to who was the most influential uh, thinker in terms of influencing people to become New Agers, and the vote was heavily in favor of a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest by the name of Teilhard de Chardin. And this man was a paleontologist as well as a theologian, and in one of his books, The Phenomenon of Man, he said this, Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It's much more. It's a general condition to which all theories, all systems, all hypotheses must bow, in which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines of thought must follow. In other words, evolution to him was essentially was God. You have to be thinkable and true. It has to be evolution. Well, that... Uh, teaching of De Chardin has had a tremendous impact even, even among scientists as well as many other people. And you say, well, wasn't he a Catholic? Didn't he believe in Christianity? Didn't he believe in Christ? Yeah, he did. In a way, here's what he said about Christ. He said, it's Christ in very truth who saves. But should we not immediately add that at the same time it's Christ who is saved by evolution? Evolution was his God. And the God of the New Age movement is evolution. Matter of fact, there are many different cults and movements among the so-called New Age emphasis today, but without exception, all of them are based on evolution. And so evolution is the one factor in common that they all have. Another one, the other common factor that all exhibit, is a belief in a coming world government, a world culture, a world religion. Sir Julian Huxley, who was the first director general of UNESCO and who put his stamp of belief on UNESCO when he was director and is still there, he says, accordingly, UNESCO's outlook must, it seems, be based on some form of humanism. It must be an evolutionary humanism. It's essential for UNESCO to adopt an evolutionary approach. The general philosophy of UNESCO must be a scientific world, humanism, global in extent, and evolutionary in background, and so on and so forth. And that philosophy of a global evolutionary, evolutionary humanistic religion is common in every New Age cult that we know anything about today. It's the thing that stimulates all of them. A man who is a modern leader in the United Nations organization, Richard Muller, has said the most fundamental thing we can do today is to believe in evolution. Well, time doesn't allow going into this either, but whether we're talking about atheistic humanism, such as advocated by men like Darwin and Dewey and Huxley and so on, or pantheistic evolutionism, such as advocated by the New Age movement, one says that the universe is explained by chance, by random processes. The other says, well, no, there's too much evidence of design and intelligence in it to explain by chance, but we are not going to believe in a God, therefore we've got to find some other explanation. So they believe that the universe itself is God, that it has consciousness and is planning and designing. They call it Mother Nature or Mother Earth or something like that. But all are based on evolution. Now let me read one other statement and then I'll close. This is statement kind of evaluating the New Age movement as based on evolution. This is by a man by the name of Jeremy Rifkin. He says, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in somebody else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It is our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to any outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior. We're now the architects of the universe. We're responsible to nothing outside ourselves, but we're the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I wouldn't call that blasphemy, but that's the attitude. He goes on to say that he finds a lot of fault with Darwinism, but he still believes in the New Age evolutionism, and that's the wave of the future. Finally, the very last thing he says in his book is, our future is secured, and then he says this, the cosmos wails. If this really comes to pass, like they're thinking, it will be a terrible thing for this world, but it's sure moving in that direction very rapidly now. And apart from divine intervention, that's what's going to happen in the days to come. We need to be aware we're in a serious warfare 
We need to be well equipped for the war with the great armor that God has provided for us, the Christian armor. We need to be aware that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the activity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Thank you very much. Evolution is truly not a science. It's a religion. It's a religious worldview about the past with implications and doctrines into the present. John, is Dr. Morris telling us, though, that evolution is to blame for these things like abortion, homosexuality, pornography? I mean, is it really the root cause of these things? No, not really. Sin, of course, is the real issue, but evolution in many circles is the scientific justification for these sinful actions. Your book, The Lie, Evolution, discusses these implications of evolution. It's a truly delightful book at a layman's level. Can you think of any other books we ought to mention? Well, certainly. The Long War Against God by Dr. Henry Morris goes into these issues in detail. In fact, this program was based on part of this book. It truly is one of the most important books of our day. Another book of his which discusses these things is called Creation and the Modern Christian. But my favorite book is the Genesis Record. It provides the foundation for our whole way of thinking and helps us build the right worldview, the biblical worldview. He also has a book called Education for the Real World. We see how these issues play themselves out in the education sphere in this particular book. A Christian could hardly read any of these books and not be convinced that evolution is a real danger against which he must be inoculated. These and other creation materials, including other programs in this Back to Genesis series, have been mightily used by God to answer questions both biblical and scientific, to convince skeptics of the truth of creation, to train up children in the way they should go, and to establish the importance of creation to the Christian faith. These materials can be ordered by calling toll-free 1-800-628-7640 or by writing to the Institute for Creation Research at Post Office Box 2667, El Cajon, California, 92021.